Greetings, Lizzie. Um, you fired a load of questions at me and it's just where to begin. What sort of person was I as a kid? Precocious. Uh, <laughs> I bet that's a surprise. Um, I first uh, got involved in the Palestinian cause uh, when I was 13 years old. Somebody gave me a petition to sign and I said, why should I sign this petition? These people are terrorists. They're hijacking the Achille Lauro. They're um, hijacking planes. They're, you know, doing crazy stuff. And it was explained to me the whole history of Palestine, the Nakba, the creation of uh, Israel, uh, Zionism, the political ideology, which is, you know, not all Jews are Zionists and not all Zionists are Jews and all that sort of thing. So I immediately saw the injustices. How can you take lands from one person and give them to somebody else? And, and uh, Britain was meddling way back in, in the 1920s on this. And, you know, we've now got basically what is a colonial settler state. And the oppression of the Palestinians is horrendous. So for decades now, I've um, been trying to raise awareness about the injustices um, for the Palestinian people. And, uh, and, and you know, it's a polarising debate and I think people need to stop shouting over each other and sit down and talk. Yeah, um, I've been through the killing fields of Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Palestine, Syria... Uh, I've been to the Rohingya uh, refugee camps um, where 750,000 people just fled from Myanmar into neighbouring Bangladesh. I was also in Sri Lanka covering the war there when the Tamil Tigers were fighting uh, the government. And um, of course Lebanon, um, I was there. Uh, when uh, the Israelis bombed Lebanon and, and destroyed every single bridge south of the Latani River. So yes, I've seen enough wars to understand that uh, they're pointless. You cannot bring about peace at the barrel of a gun. Simple as that. It can't be done. But you can make it a lot of money especially if you're an arms dealer. And unfortunately, Britain, the country I live in, um, makes quite a tidy living out of selling weapons to some really brutal regimes and uh, regimes that are prepared to turn these weapons on women and children. So, um, yes, I, I, it has been a, a gut-wrenching experience and uh, the antidote for me is coming back here to my home in Scotland. It, it's nestling in the hills, in the borders, and it's absolutely idyllic. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's a great place for me to uh, come and recharge my batteries. Um, but I, I will say that... Uh, the two assignments in particular have taken their toll. One was interviewing Syrian women prisoners who had been held in the Assad regime. And that was very, very difficult to document all of the war crimes against them. And the other was again documenting war crimes, this time against the Rohingya people. And what pained me more than anything else was that the de facto leader was Ansar. Suu Kyi. And of course, I'm finding it very difficult to summon any sympathy for her at the moment because she's back under the jackboot of the Myanmar military. And uh, that country had so much promise. And when she came to power, you know, people were saying she's the female version of Nelson Mandela. Well, what a disappointment uh, that turned out to be. So, um, Going back to something that I'd said, um, it wasn't an original quote, the pen is mightier than the sword, um, but it is mighty. And uh, both um, in exposing evil and, and, uh, and, and bad things that people in powerful places will do. 
and and um, so that's what I try and do as a journalist um, use my pen to hold people to account and uh, <laughs> um, that's probably why I'm not popular in in some circles so um, but and I'm just having a look at in more detail at this this question of yours. Um, how can we trust if the might was used with good intentions? It has greatly helped the propaganda against the minorities and racism in political controversies. It's nourished Islamophobia and discriminations. Not just Muslim countries were affected by the negative influence of the minorities in Africa and on the subcontinent. Slavery, violence, sexual violence has increased. Um, yes, it has. And shall I tell you who is behind it all? Men. Not all men, but a lot of men. The majority of um, wars are started by men. The majority of human humanitarian conflicts are started by men. Even in countries where there are women leaders, they are merely part of the patriarchy. Um, they happen to be in power because they were born female. Um, had there been brothers around, Aung San Suu Kyi wouldn't have been chosen as the de facto leader. She was following on from the patriarchal privileged uh, elitist position left by her father. And, and the same with uh, Sheikh um, Hasina in in Bangladesh, you know, she's ruthless in, in dealing with dissenting voices, for sure. Uh, and again, uh, she's the, the head of a patriarchal dynasty. So most of the wars are started by men, fueled by men. And what I would say to the majority of, of men in the world today is sort out your tribe now. Um, you know, men have got to step up to the plate. Uh, I was just suggesting on Twitter the other day uh, that it's not safe for women to walk the streets. So should we stay indoors? Absolutely not. Men should stay indoors or give them all body cams to wear when they go out or have a nighttime curfew. And let's see how the crime figures, the violence, the rape, the murder, the abuse. Let's see what happens if men aren't allowed out on the streets on a night time. Uh, some radical thinking there, and, and uh, which will make me even more popular <laughs> among some uh, circles. But you know, uh, for thousands of years, men have been causing problems. Um, they've rarely been the solutions, they've caused the problems. And I really think that um, we need to start adopting a feminist driven foreign policy uh, in our countries. And uh, they have in, in Sweden. I mean, Sweden doesn't go to war, does it? Uh, Finland hasn't gone to war. New Zealand, you know, these the, there are remarkable women leaders in the world today. And they are shining lights of, of, of how an empowered woman can uh, bring uh, peace and stability. Well, I was never an earth mother, as my daughter Daisy will testify, but I do love her. Um, I wouldn't call her my best friend, um, and she certainly wouldn't call me her best friend. You know, I we do have that mother-daughter relationship, as I say, I love her dearly. I'm there for her if she needs me. She's my biggest supporter. She's my biggest critic. And, you know, we've just got this uh, wonderful relationship and a, a mutual respect. She didn't go into journalism. She's in marketing and, and uh, quite a hard-nosed little madam. Uh, very successful and I'm really um, immensely proud of her. And... Uh, the lockdown has been tough because I haven't been able to see that much of her. But through the medium of Zoom and, and all this technology that we've got, uh, we still, you know, maintain uh, daily contact. 
the mentors that I had from a distance were Robert Fisk, was Carl Bernstein from the Watergate scandal, John Pilger from Australia. The, there have been some amazing journalists out there and you can get a feel for someone's uh, writing and, and uh, sincerity and integrity. Um, we have a, a right-wing columnist in uh, Britain called Peter Oborn. On paper, he and I shouldn't get on at all. Uh, completely different classes. I'm a working class girl and, and uh, he's from an elite privileged class. But we get on. And, and we're both dedicated to delivering the truth and, and without fear, without favour. And so, although our politics are different, um, I have the utmost respect for him. So lots of different mentors. Probably the most recent influential mentor for me was an Egyptian, Dr. Ahmed Mustafa, um, wonderful man. And he said to me, stop being so confrontational. Stop going in front of the tank and going stop. <laughs> he said, when a lot of the time you can just bypass it and continue on your journey. You don't have to have a big dramatic uh, confrontation. And he was right. And as a result, um, I'm not getting as um, arrested as many times <laughs> these days. <laughs> I think the last time I was arrested was um, was in uh, Tripoli in Libya uh, during the fall of Gaddafi and the rise of the Arab Spring. And I was um, arrested by some militia. Um, of course, all a, a misunderstanding and, and it didn't get reported. I just thought, oh gosh, I can't, can do without uh, this publicity. No journalist wants to be the story. Definitely friends. I have some rock solid friends. I can probably count on two hands uh, that I have um, met and, and accrued and, and kept over the years. Some of them I don't speak to for years, but I know if I pick up the phone, they'll be there for me. And uh, so I have a, a wonderful eclectic group of um, friends who have been very, very supportive. And, uh, you know, family's usually there, but journalism, it, it's a bit of a weird occupation and, and not everybody understands it. I have been rejected by some people who I thought were friends. I've been ridiculed by somebody who I thought was a friend. And, and that really stung, that really hurt me. But um, on the whole, most of my friends can see that I'm still the same crazy Geordie uh, girl uh, that I was before I embraced Islam, but just without the alcohol. And so, you know, it's still party central when I'm around, but um, as I say, it's um, I'm in alcohol-free zone these days.